The most famous thing that we all know about Isaac Newton is the image of the falling apple giving him the inspiration for his mathematical theories of motion. But he also spent a lot of time studying alchemy, trying to change base metals into gold. We now know that this research was futile. You can't use chemistry to turn atoms of one atomic number into atoms of another atomic number. So, in some important sense, Newton's conception of what gold is was not quite right. We now define gold as being made of atoms of atomic number 79, a definition that simply wasn't available to Newton. But when Newton used the word gold, he was still referring to the thing that we have now defined more precisely. And I think a similar story can be told about the words rational and reason. Philosophers have been talking about logic, reason and rationality for thousands of years. But now we have the concepts of formal systems and computation that simply weren't available to the earlier generation of philosophers. So today, I think we can define reason as being our ability to organize and explain our thinking, and rationality as our ability to support our thinking with calculations, such as mathematics, symbolic logic, or more generally, a computation. In this video, I'm going to look at how the history of logical reasoning fits into this picture. This is an episode of Go Meta, where I explore ideas in a way that I hope contributes to a culture of healthy public discussion. From a Western philosophical perspective, the history of logical reasoning started with the ancient Greek philosophers over 2,000 years ago. And in some simplistic sense, you could say that the three most famous Greek philosophers, Socrates, who taught Plato, who taught Aristotle, foretold the long arc of this history from oral reasoning to prose-written logic to the beginnings of symbolic logic. Socrates did not write any texts. Plato wrote many texts especially about Socrates' method of using a questioning and answering dialogue to explore and expose the logical consequences or contradictions of someone's thinking. But it was Aristotle who first used symbolic notation to rigorously catalogue a series of logical argumentation rules called syllogisms or deductions. A simple, classic example of a prose deduction is as follows. First, we have the premises all cats have whiskers, and Tom is a cat. And from these two, we get the conclusion that inevitably follows, Tom has whiskers. The reason for being so clear and precise in the structure of the logical argument is so that any reasonable person would be compelled to agree that the conclusion follows undeniably from the premises. We can then convert this argument into a symbolic form by replacing the term cat with the symbol A, whiskers with B and Tom with C. And we now have a simple symbolic formulation of one of the rules of deduction into which we can swap other words in the place of A, B and C. For example, if we replace A with cities, B with houses and C with Paris, we then get another example of using the same deduction rule. If we believe that both of the premises are true, then logic compels us to accept that the conclusion is also true. Aristotle identified a whole collection of such symbolic rules, and we can think of this collection as a rational tool, similar to the rational tools I've talked about in other videos. This would be a rational tool for calculating logical conclusions using the rules of symbolic logic. The premises are the inputs, and we crank the handle to get the conclusion as the indisputable output. One thing that has changed since Aristotle's time is that we now have computers, machines that can systematically follow these symbolic rules. So today, we can make the case for a slightly newer, more precise definition of what counts as a rational argument by linking it to our notions of formal systems and computation. So in the case we've been looking at, we can say that the prose logical argument is a rational argument because it can be supported by an equivalent symbolic argument whose conclusion could be calculated by a computer. 
But converting a prose logical argument into symbolic logic is not always as easy as one might hope. Indeed, working in symbolic logic is hard. And arguably, it took over 2,000 years before mathematicians and philosophers working in the 19th century, like Boole, Frege, and Piano, started to make significant advances on the project that Aristotle had begun. The vast majority of logical reasoning has been done in prose form without providing the supporting symbolic calculations. And logic, written in prose text, can leave room for ambiguities that require subjective interpretation. For example, let's look at another simple prose argument. All animals are living beings, and all cats are animals, from which we get the conclusion that all cats are living beings. You can probably see where this is going. If we remember the simple argument we were making earlier about Tom from Tom and Jerry, we get into trouble when we bring these two together. All cats are living beings. Tom is a cat. Therefore, Tom is a living being. Well, this is wrong, because we all know that Tom is just a cartoon character. And of course, when we earlier said that Tom is a cat, we didn't mean cat in the same sense as when we later said that all cats are animals. In prose arguments, such subtleties of what we mean when we use a term can be easily implied by the context. But symbolic logic is less forgiving, and the semantics, the meaning of terms, has to be more rigorously defined. And the process of translating a prose argument into symbolic logic is likely to pick up such conflicts of meaning, as well as other gaps in the original prose logic. Let's look at an example of how a translation into symbolic logic can pick up ambiguous gaps in the original prose argument. In 1710, philosopher George Berkeley published a text in which he wrote out his so-called master argument for idealism, the philosophical position that everything that exists does so in relation to a mind. Berkeley wrote this crucial argument of his in the form of a prose dialogue between two characters, Philonus and Hylas, very much like the kinds of dialogues that Plato was writing 2,000 years earlier. The details of the argument are not so relevant here as the written prose form Berkeley used, and that he did not also provide an equivalent symbolic version of the argument. To be fair, most of the techniques of modern symbolic logic had not yet been invented at the time that Berkeley was writing. Nearly 200 years later, in the excellent book Beyond the Limits of Thought, Graham Priest at one point undertakes the work to translate Berkeley's prose logic into symbolic logic. And there are two important details that Priest notes during this translation. The first is that his initial attempt to translate the argument revealed a number of gaps in the original prose argument, ambiguities in the original text. To complete the translation, Priest had to make some choices about how to fill in those ambiguities to arrive at what Priest calls the most plausible symbolic form for the argument. Again, the exact details of the symbolic logical argument are not so relevant here. Rather, what's important here is the interpretive work that Priest had to do to create this symbolic form from the original text. The second interesting detail that Priest notes is that another philosopher, A. N. Pryor, had, in 1955, taken a slightly different approach to filling in the ambiguous gaps in Berkeley's original prose argument. So we can see that, yes, Berkeley's argument is indeed a rational argument, because it can be supported by an equivalent argument in formal symbolic logic. However, we might say that Berkeley's argument was not perfectly rational, as it had ambiguities that two different later philosophers could choose to resolve in different ways. We can now link this all back to the start of the video, where I talked about how the definition of gold has become more precise as we've learned more. Similarly, today we can be more precise about the definition of what counts as a rational argument. In particular, we can say that a reasoned argument is a rational logical argument if we can translate it into an equivalent argument written in formal symbolic logic. 
in the way that Priest did with Barclay's argument. The more easily and unambiguously the original prose argument can be translated into symbolic form, the more rational it can claim to be. We rarely actually do the translation work, but if an argument is claiming that it is rational, it is effectively promising that the translation would be possible. And today, if you want to prove that your argument is a rational, logical argument, the best way to do that is to provide a version of your argument already written in formal symbolic logic. And if it's not possible to make a translation into symbolic form, this effectively means that it's not possible to make a version of the argument that progresses in an undeniable set of logical steps from premises to conclusions. It suggests that the argument still rests strongly on human judgment, rather than depending only on the systematic following of logical rules. This would still leave the argument as a reasoned argument, possibly a well-reasoned argument, but the argument could not claim the quality of being a rational, logical argument. And although the conceptions of rational logic used by earlier philosophers like Berkeley were clearly referring to the same thing we mean today, there are at least two ways in which their earlier conceptions of rationality were insufficient. Firstly, we are much more aware today about the deep problems when trying to translate natural language into symbolic notation. Secondly, we now know the limits of logic. The development of formal logic and mathematics gave rise to theoretical work that showed that there are hard limits to what formal systems could ever be capable of doing. Together, these two issues mean that we have a much clearer understanding today of what logic is and what it can and cannot do. In contrast, at the time that Berkeley wrote his prose argument we saw earlier, and that Newton was experimenting with alchemy, these hard limits on logic were not known. Indeed, a contemporary of theirs, Leibniz, expressed their time's bold confidence in rationality when he argued that one day all reason disputes would be settled by simply saying, let us calculate without further ado and see who is right. In future videos, I will explore what we now know about the hard limits on rationality and show why in some ways Leibniz's confidence in rational calculation was as misguided as Newton's hopes to turn lead into gold. Ironically, it was calculations in the spheres of symbolic logic and mathematics that settled this dispute. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please do click on the like button below or subscribe to my channel, as that will encourage YouTube to share this video more widely. And what do you think about this newer definition of rationality? Please do leave comments below. Thank you for watching.